Thank you, Lisa. That song has certainly become a pillar. Praise be. One, just a moment here, Bob. Um, folks, sometimes I, and you who attend uh, rather faithfully on Wednesday nights know that sometimes I just want to talk to you. <laughs> sometimes I just have some things that I feel are important to communicate and to receive from you, to be sure. And this is kind of one of those times, from the moment I got up this morning, I felt like my mind was going in 15 different directions on Christmas Eve. I mean, this is huge. Christmas Eve is monumental. And how do you get a handle on that? And what do you communicate? First of all, I want to communicate gratitude. Guess who's sitting here? None other than Blake. There he is. There he is. He's a perfect fit in that family. Look how handsome he is. And he's doing well. I was afraid to uh, touch him, not knowing what had been broken and, and uh, where surgical sites were and all that. But uh, he said the right side was good, so I clapped him on his right side. Remember that if you greet him. He has been the recipient of much prayer, ardent prayer, it was a really close call for Blake, and yet there he is, praise be. I'm so happy about that. And uh, my friend John Eleazar, or Eleazar is here. Oh, man, John, you know, he lived down near where we live on Crooked Lake. And uh, he and Robin, I don't know what got into him, but they moved to Winter Haven. <laughs> Way north of Winter Haven, so far north... I tried to find it one time, and I was running into Atlanta traffic. I knew I'd gone too far. But they live in your community, and they are just wonderful friends, members of our Sunday school class down at First Baptist Lake Wales. Glad to see John, to be sure. And there are other guests here, Christmas guests. Please greet them. Say hello to them. You're glad to see them. And uh, remember that as many as come in for Christmas time also leave of our congregation going to their homes and to their families wherever they might be. So remember them uh, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day and days following as they travel. Um, let's pray together. Our Father, on this eve of Christmas Day that we recognize the birth of Emmanuel, God with us, I pray that you would be with us by your Spirit in a special way, awakening some out of slumber and revealing yourself for the first time to others and just comforting those in the body of Christ that are experiencing loss and uh, difficulty and they have more questions than they do answers in life although they have answers in theology father i pray that you would bless those that are caring for the citizens right now as we meet to worship bless the hospitals and the nursing homes and the assisted care facilities and bless those fire departments bless those police departments bless that sheriff's office and wherever it is, they stand to protect the citizens of this community. And they work on Christmas Eve. Fill their minds with your wonder and your grace, I pray. Fill our hearts with deep appreciation. And dear God, would you please cross our hearts right now in our mind's eye with people in need, people that are hurt, people that are recovering, like Max at Life Care, bless her, a friend of mine, Don Drool, bless him, there are so, so many. Would you draw us to be a people of prayer collectively and individually? May we be more like Jesus because we intercede for others. Lord, hear our prayer and grant Christmas in our hearts, I pray, in the name of the Christ child. Amen.
My wife yesterday was doing some housekeeping things with our finances and so forth. And she said, did you know what the interest rate is on your Lowe's credit card? And I said, no, because I hardly ever use it, except when it's to great advantage to. And we never carry a balance. I think that she was um, trying to remind me to never carry a balance. Because the interest rate fluctuates depending on some rationale known only to Lowe's, Bank of America, whoever it is that you might have credit cards with, the interest rate fluctuates between 32 and a half and 36. Did you know that? You better take a look at your credit card statement. No matter who you have, I can assure you that it's run by Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. <laughs> and here's what that means. If you carry a balance on your credit card, meaning you don't pay it off every single month, you ought to find a way to pay it off, find a way to work on that thing, chip it away, because it's going to strangle you. If you charge your gas at the gas pump and it's $3 a gallon, you just paid 4 for it. That's what it means. And bigger than that, and in this time of gift giving and gift receiving, it's probably too late to say so, but golly day, avoid financing gifts at all costs because you're going to be paying for them at Easter time and way beyond, way beyond. There, there's a tyranny in indebtedness, and there's a great freedom in living debt-free. So do what you can and av avoid things that you'd like to have if you have to finance it. And when you put it on a credit card, you are financing it. Be careful. I want to show you a video that I started out my day with today. I was blessed beyond measure. It kind of even brought a tear or two to my cheek. It happened uh, just a couple of weeks ago on Times Square in New York City, Gotham. It happened there. Take a look at this. I called Tim and he was so flexible and he was able to download this and present it, and then Bob's going to come and read.
Jesus, the light of the world, and the different languages, major languages of the world. Thank you, Tim. Let there be light. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Tim can really recover. <laughs> well, um, I've entitled this morning's message based on a reading that you will hear in just a moment. But I want to say it's a very different, unexpected reading for Christmas. And I have entitled the message, What Child Is This? Or better yet, Whose Child Is This? Bob? This is Matthew 22, uh, beginning at verse 41. <clears throat> While the Pharisees were together, Jesus questioned them. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? David's, they told him. He asked them, how is it then that David, inspired by the Spirit, calls him Lord? The Lord declared to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If David calls him Lord, how then can the Messiah be his son? No one was able to answer him at all. And from that day, no one dared to question him anymore. I bet. <laughs> Thank you, Bob. Singing and reading on the same morning. Switch hitter. Well, our world is um, obviously making a concerted effort to neutralize Christmas, to redefine Christmas, to dilute Christmas, that people not fully realize what it's all about. We were doing very well uh, up until a few years ago, we were really rebounding. There was more and more Merry Christmas and Merry Christmas to you, sir. Merry Christmas to you, ma'am. All throughout retail and so forth, more and more. But in the last few years, it's starting to wane again. I, I always say Merry Christmas to any clerk, anybody, waitress, whomever it might be. Merry Christmas. And now I'm hearing that age-old, sad refrain, happy holidays. I always like to correct that and say if you want to refer to the real meaning of the word holiday, it's holy day, and I will accept that. Happy holy days to you. I don't know what it is that uh, the reason that it's on the wane again, maybe you can connect the dots and come to your own conclusions. I did see, never mind. Please don't think for a moment that these attempts to redefine, obfuscate, confuse the meaning of Christmas are no less than an attempt to confuse the significance of Christmas. And don't think that these attempts are accidental. Don't think that they are mere social evolution. Not at all. There is both a plan and a personality behind these attempts. A plan and a personality in the same way that there was a personality behind the wind and the waves that Jesus rebuked in the presence of the apostles. There is a being behind the watering down of the genuine meaning of the Advent season. Hope, faith, peace, love, joy, the Christ candle. Why would anybody want to dilute that unless you've got another dark agenda very much at work? But under this roof today, I would suspect, with very few exceptions, we know what Christmas is, and we know who Christmas is about. The Bible presents the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem as an incarnational miracle of Almighty El Elyon, Almighty God. He has entered into the created order via 
virgin birth, which is a miracle of the first order and degree. Unlike Pastor Jim, who no doubt went to a good seminary, I could tell, I think I could tell, and I am always absolutely delighted to see Jim and Marsha. Delighted. They fill my cup. And triply delighted to see Blake this morning. Man. I started to say something about my seminary. It was awful. It was awful. Oh my goodness, we declared while I was there spiritual sisterhood with Duke Theological Seminary, home of the Blue Devils and other devils. Spiritual sisterhood declaring Nelson Mandela to be the most spiritual man alive, and on and on. My seminary professors rejected the birth of Jesus as being virgin on the basis of science. It seems that they wanted street cred more than they wanted kingdom of God credibility, accuracy, and truth. Love and joy and hope and peace. Duh! It was a miracle, gentlemen! This birth was spectacular. It was predicted and taught by a number of prophets long before the event, announced by a multitude of angels, accompanied by no less than celestial choreography, and it was understood without reservation and without hesitation by the apostles. This birth was the appropriate and miraculous starting point of the life of the Son of God. The Son of God and our understanding of the Christmas story. To omit the virgin birth is to fracture the very foundation of the Christian message. It is to omit, to erode the integrity and thus the impact of everything that followed Bethlehem. The real meaning of Christmas, in fact, the very essence of Christianity, in fact, the hope and the future of the world, hinges on nothing less than the identity of that baby. What? child is this? Whose child is this? Was this baby simply the overachieving son of the peasants Mary and Joseph, as some might say? Or is he active and continuous here? Is he who he taught he was? Who he thought he was? who he said he was, and who he proved he is, the Son of God. Crucial to our hope is the immutable truth of Christ's parentage. Crucial to our joy is that same truth. The importance of who Jesus is cannot be overstated and it must never be understated. Because how we see Jesus defines how we respond to him. And how we respond to him determines our very eternity. 
we must settle the issue of the parentage of Jesus Christ. Some would say, and some have always said, that Jesus was the son of illegitimacy. If you have time, would you mind turning in your Bibles to John chapter 8 and verse 40? 40. Jesus says, you seek to kill me. Speaking to a host of religious bigots, you want to kill me. A man who has told you the truth that I heard from God Abraham didn't do this. You uh, do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, listen to what they said to Jesus. We were not born of fornication. We have but one father, God. We weren't born of fornication. Fill in the blanks. What are they saying? What are they accusing? Him of being illegitimate. Now note this. Those cold words of the Pharisees are at least we know who our fathers are. You don't. Illegitimacy has always borne some stigma. It always has. It's inescapable. I was watching the news, a recap of 2022, actually, because 2023 is not over. But they said illegitimate births, if you would, afflict 28% of the Caucasians, 75% of black Americans, 75%. Our society is paying a heavy price for that. And there should never be any stigma attached to the child. Never. It is inescapable toward parents, if you would. But never should it be levied at the child, which is precisely what the Pharisees did to Jesus. Now, don't miss the sarcasm here. And don't miss the irony. The Pharisees knew in their circles that Joseph had never made any claim to be in the father of Jesus the Christ. He never made any claim to that. That would have been a lie. And Joseph, above all people, would have known that. Jesus had just slammed them with truth, and they respond to him, they retaliate against him with error. Now here are the implications of this. If their charge is accurate, then all Biblical revelation is wrong. Now pay your dime and take your choice. If they're right, the prophets are wrong. If they're right, the apostles are wrong. If they're right, the angels are wrong. God is wrong. So don't even entertain that nonsense. Simply put, they were losing their power. That's why they did it. Jesus was a threat with his truth. That's why they did it. Jesus was sinless. And this is powerful. Jesus was probably 30 years old when he's standing before them and they are slamming him. And they could not accuse him of anything. Therefore, they had to go all the way back to his birth and disparage his birth. I wish that that could be said about me, that you would have to go all the way back to my birth to find any criticism, any fault, any sin. Wouldn't that be great? <coughs> we confirmed a Supreme Court justice in America not too many years back. His name was Brett Kavanaugh. He was before the Inquisition in Congress. In order to accuse Brett Kavanaugh, they had to go back to his college days of 35 years earlier. In order to find some dirt, these guardians of freedom and truth 
had to go back 35 years to accuse Brett Kavanaugh. They had to go back to birth to accuse Jesus. By the way, how would you like it if they accused you of everything during, done during college or high school years? For that matter, two years ago. I wouldn't stand up very well to that scrutiny. There are a lot in this room that wouldn't. Jesus stood up very well. Don't miss this. Jesus was offering forgiveness. And only God could offer forgiveness and carry through. For God to have been birthed through a female's body, the conception would have to be virgin. It would have to be that way. God knew what he was doing. The strategy of darkness through the centuries has been to go after the virgin birth. You wouldn't know this unless you had studied deeply, deeply into church history, but there were church fathers that were pretty noble guys most, like Irenaeus and Ignatius and Justin Martyr, who defended the Christian faith and the facts of the Christian faith, namely and eminently the virgin birth, with creeds. And these creeds were accepted within Christianity, like the Athanasian Creed, like the Nicene Creed, like the Apostles' Creed. They were hammered out in the 4th century and the 5th century because the church was drifting and people were starting to entertain nonsense. And so they had to hammer out these creeds, these confessionals, that would be spoken as a matter of routine so that the people would be reminded of what Christianity is all about. And before you get very far in those creeds, you get the virgin birth. It is that very important. The strategy of Satan has always been to erode the foundation and to birth religions that accept only the human Jesus. They say noble and wonderful things about the human Jesus, but they really recoil when you insist that Jesus is divine a miracle of the first order by the conveyance of virgin birth. They really recoil on that. And do not think that Winter Haven 2023 is an exception to that rule. I mean, good night up at the city park in Winter Haven, right across the street, if you would, as I remember correctly, you've got a mosque. They accept only the human Jesus. In my town of Lake Wales, Right through the orange groves from us, we have a Jehovah's Witness meeting hall. They accept only the human Jesus. And there are Mormon wards. I think that there's one in Winter Haven, is there? There is. There is in Lakeland. Yeah, that, yeah that's right. That's right. Human Jesus. Lots of good things. But by the way, he's not creator, he is created. And he has a brother. And his brother's name is Lucifer. He thinks this isn't too accurate. They hang nice accessories on Jesus, like a Christmas tree. Nice accessories. Oh, he was a great moral theologian. Oh, he was a wonderful teacher. Oh, he went about doing good. Well, how do you explain that he wiped away leprosy? How do you explain that he spoke to a dead little girl, Talitha Kumi, and the corpse arose? How do you explain that he restore, restored sight and arrangement of the rods and cones of the eyes to a man blind from birth? How do you explain that he was able to speak and Roman soldiers just fell over? How do you explain that? With the accessories of he was a great moral theologian and teacher. No, far, far <coughs> more than that. The world religions have got to make him human and disparage Christianity. Satan has used religionists, many professors, kings and kingdoms for centuries to erode the foundation of Christianity. Son of illegitimacy? Some would have you to think so. 
Now others would have you to think, certainly through the church age, that Jesus actually was the son of Joseph. In some circles, he was thought to be the son of Joseph. Now that is more acceptable, to be sure, but it is no less accurate. We can make Jesus as noble and honorable as possible. We can make him as virtuous or more virtuous and more gifted than anyone that has ever drawn breath. But if we make him simply the son of Joseph, may I say Christmas is over. And we remain dead in our trespass and sin. A little journey for you. If you can turn quickly, do it. And if you can't, just allow me to read it. Luke chapter 4. Let me see if I can find it. This is the occasion of our Lord's very first inaugural sermon. He came to Nazareth, that is verse 16, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And he stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found meaning he searched for, if you would, the place where it was written, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those that are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And all the eyes of all in the synagogue that day were fixed on him. And he began to say, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the day I am the Christ. No ambiguity there. All bore witness to him and they marveled at the gracious words that proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? Wait a minute. Where do you get the audacity to say what you just said? <clears throat> Aren't you Joseph's son? Now look at verse 28, or here. All those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, they were filled with wrath. Everything changed, it just hinged, if you would. They rose up and they thrust him out of the city. They led him to the brow of the hill on which the city was built, that they might throw him over the cliff. We got to stop this song. We got to stop this music. Let's throw him over the cliff, saying that he can do these things and he will do these things and that the scripture is fulfilled in our hearing. No! Anathema. That's blasphemy. Let's throw him over the cliff. He's in the midst and in the clutch of a lynch mob. And verse 30 says. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. How did that happen? Well, you can do that when you're God Almighty. Now that's a little bit subtle. That's a little bit nuanced. But I'll tell you what, if the Winter Haven police took me into custody and there were seven or eight or two or three or one big enough, I'm not just going to walk away. If I created a ruckus down at Walmart and they took me into custody of the sheriff's department, I am not just going to walk away, but he just walked through the midst of them. Huh? How about when he's in the Garden of Eden, a Garden of Gethsemane, excuse me. He was at the Garden of Eden. Make no mistake. Here come the soldiers, armed to the teeth, and many of them, who do you seek? We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't know what he looked like. We're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. I am. That's all he said. Ego and me. I am. And they were blown over like so many tin pins hit by a bowling ball. Son of Joseph? Arise, little girl. Calm down, Peter. 
This is the time, if it were not so, I could speak but a word and six legions of angels would fill the air. Or was it twelve? Legions of angels would fill the air. Son of Joseph? Oh, get out. Give me another option. Son of illegitimacy? I don't think so. Son of Joseph? Very, very inaccurate. It is entertaining to me that some actually deny the virgin birth as being biologically too difficult for God. It's just too hard. And then they affirm, at the same time with schizophrenia, the resurrection. Now that would have been kind of hard too, wouldn't it? And they affirm the creation. That would have been kind of hard too. Why go after the virgin birth as being biologically too hard for God? To reject the virgin birth is to do no less than to reject the deity of our Lord. And when you do that, you wear the crown of the Antichrist. That rejects the homoousius, eternal relationship between the Son and the Father. Isaiah said that the Son of God would be born of a woman, but given by God by the conveyance of virgin birth. The herald angel said, he is the son of the highest, he is the son of God. To accept these truths is foundational to biblical theology, foundational to our celebration of Christmas. You know what Jesus said? Who do men say that I am? Well, some say you're that Moses-like prophet, and some say that you're John the Baptist reincarnate, and some say that you're Elijah reincarnate and among us. But who do you say that I am? Peter said, why? You're the Christ. May I drift forward just one more time to John 8, I'm sorry, it is not John 8, it is Luke 22, it is right where we started this, Matthew 22, I told you my mind was going in a hundred different directions this morning, Matthew 22, Bob read this, what do you think about the Christ, whose son is he? That's the biggest question, whose son is he? What child is this? They said to him, he's the son of David. He said to them, how then does David, by the Spirit, call him Lord? Called him actively, with personality, Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. This was a thousand years before Bethlehem. A thousand years. Got that? Now when Peter says, you are the Christ, Jesus says, blessed art you. Art thou, Simon Barjona? Flesh and blood hadn't revealed that one to you, but my Father which is in heaven. You didn't get that on the street corner. You got that from the Holy Spirit. Indeed, I am the Christ. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. You're the Christ. Jesus says, right. Then he demonstrates it with the resurrection. But if that be right, David called the Christ Lord in conversation So Jesus could not be the son of David. He preceded David. And if he preceded David, and he's standing before the apostles, and Peter says, you are the Christ, that means you who were alive before David, who was a thousand years ago, are still alive and before us now. Do you know any thousand-year-old people? How could he be a thousand years old and be illegitimate or the son of Joseph? Standing right there, it was undeniable. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Who do men say that I am? Jesus said. Friends, our Lord is much, much more than the overachieving son of a carpenter. He did what he did by the power of who he is. So there is but one final option. That Jesus of Nazareth is actually Jesus of eternity and that he is the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. He is the eternal and the great I am. That's why he quoted Moses, the burning bush, quoted from the Old Testament, and he said, I am, and the Roman soldiers just fell over as helpless. The babe in the manger is the great I am, just like Lisa sang. He is the great I am, the only begotten of the Father. Friends, here's the way it is as far as I'm concerned. If Jesus be not God, let the wise men take their gifts back. If Jesus be not God, let the Christmas star recede into oblivion. If Jesus be not God, Throw the scripture away and let your worship fall on another. But he has proved beyond the shadow of any intelligent doubt that he is indeed who he thought he was, who he taught he was, and who he proved he is. God Almighty, Jesus is Lord. You sang it. You'll sing it again tonight in Silent Night. Lord at thy birth. Hallelujah. All hail the power of the name of Jesus. The matchless name of Jesus. He has many antagonists. He has many accusers. He always has. But he has no equals. He has no equals at all. Just antagonists and devoted followers. Be involved in that latter group. I beg you, be involved in that latter group. I want to see you in heaven.